to win a pizza oven. Game day or any day, all pirates prefer PBR. You know texting while driving is dangerous. That's not new information. Yet most people admit to doing it anyway. Drivers are 23 times more likely to be involved in a car accident while texting. Know the facts and wait to text. The danger is real and it applies to you. Auto Owners Insurance, the no problem people. Information provided by Virginia Tech Transportation Institute. This is Brian Smith with Town Insurance in Greenville. Call me today at 756-8300. Go Pirates! Great food, great atmosphere, and great service is Atavola Market Cafe. Atavola is simply a restaurant that focuses on that, being a great restaurant. There's something for everyone at Atavola. The menu offers a variety of great choices like pastas, pizzas, sandwiches, soups, salads, and seasonal rotating selections. Lunch or dinner, Atavola is always the right call. Call ahead and get Atavola to go. Or stop by the bar for a drink with friends. It's simple. Come and eat at Atavola Market Cafe, Red Banks Road next to Food Lion, and AtavolaMarket.com. Atavola, pirates supporting pirates. Whether you're at the worksite or the trailhead, you need an ATV with power and performance, technology to make every job easier, and a time-tested promise of quality and dependability. You need the 2022 Honda Ford Tracks lineup, available now at Ron Ayers Motorsports, Highway 11, north of the airport in Greenville. Then you'll learn how life is better on a Honda ATV. For riders 16 years old and older, Honda recommends that all ATV riders take a training course and read the owner's manual thoroughly. When I need jeans, I order online because I know exactly what I want. They have just one moving part. And if there's something wrong, I exchange them. Buying a vehicle, especially pre-owned, is way different. Lots of moving parts. You don't want to get stuck. For a worry-free purchase, visit Phelps Chevrolet. We've been here in town a very long time. You know us. You know we stand behind everything we sell. Phelps Chevrolet in Greenville. Come get you one. East Coast Grading and Utilities is your source for clearing, hauling dirt, and concrete work. East Coast Grading and Utilities handles all sewer and water issues as well. I'm David Vaughn. Whether you're putting in a new subdivision or helping you with any and all of your drainage problems, I can get the job done. Call me at 531-7494. No job is too big or too small. East Coast Grading and Utilities. Friends helping friends. 531-7494. For East Coast Grading and Utilities. Ahoy, mateys, it's Captain Jack Spare of R&R Tire Express. We're here to serve our pirate community by offering easy payments for easy ownership. For you landlubbers, R&R will install a new set of tires for just $20. $50 installs new custom wheels and tires. To learn more about R&R, stop by 3920 US 264 or rnrtires.com. This is Pirate Radio, WGHB Farmville, 1250 at 92.7 FM Greenville, WDLX Washington, 930 at 104.1 FM Washington. The following is an exclusive presentation of Pirate Radio, the voice of the Pirate Nation. This is Eastern Carolina's longest-running sports radio show. The Brian Bailey Show is on the air. The Brian Bailey Show is powered by Greenville Utilities and also brought to you by Angus Grill, Bostic Sug Furniture, Bojangles, East Coast Grady, Papa John's, Pepsi, The Rick House, Greenville Utilities, BMS Builders, Seared Chop House, The Gavigan Agency, Taft Taft and Hagler, tiebreakers and greenville auto world and now here's brian bailey happy monday everybody welcome into our show to kick off your football week it's a homecoming week for east carolina it's also hall of fame weekend coming up for the pirates as east carolina takes on the memphis tigers at 7 30 at dowdy ficklin stadium coming up on saturday night coming up on our show on this monday roy tesh he's the east carolina defensive tackles coach under mike houston and that pirate staff he's going to join us to dissect the 24 9 and lost to Tulane over the weekend in New Orleans. The back half hour will have Marcus Crandall, the former East Carolina Pirate quarterback who was a member of the 2022 class, the Hall of Fame class at East Carolina. He is a class individual, Marcus Crandall, the former Robertsonville Roanoke star, and he was a great quarterback in the mid-90s for East Carolina. He joins us in the back half hour. Again, Pirates fall to Tulane 24-9. Roy Tesh, defensive tackles coach at East Carolina, kicks off our show and we'll kick off the show after this.
Greenville Utilities Electric customers will soon be able to receive text notifications in the event of power outages. Enrollment is automatic, so make sure GUC has your cell phone number by signing into your account at GUC.com, then update the information in your user profile. Want to talk with someone instead? Call 252-752-7166 during business hours. 252-752-7166. Update us so we can update you. Visit GUC.com for more information. This is John Gavigan with the Gavigan Agency. Our top priority is doing what is best for our members. Whether you are buying a new vehicle, a new home, protecting your family with life insurance, or filing a claim, our agency will be there every step of the way. Our goal is to become a trusted advisor for you and your family for all of your personal and commercial insurance needs. Give us a call in Greenville at 756-1400 for a car, home, business, or life insurance quote today. And give us the opportunity to show you the benefits of doing business with someone Someone who cares. BMS Builders is your premier custom builder in eastern North Carolina. With homes in Blackwood, Mills Creek, Dalton's Cove and Farmville, and Belmar and Aiden, they're constantly expanding. Now to Laurel Glen and Sarah's Way, plus the new duplex community at Abigail Trails. BMS Builders can build the home of your dreams. Just ask Dr. Dennis Ross in Greenville or ECU football coach Mike Houston. They built their homes and they can build yours as well. Call 916-1578 for BMS Builders. The Angus Grill is your premier spot for the best burgers, cheesesteaks, and brisket sandwiches around. Join us for our unmatched variety of burger combinations. From the mushroom bacon Swiss burger to the jalapeno popper burger to the original Angus classic. Pair that burger with our amazing onion rings, tots, fries, or sweet potato fries. Angus Grill, with four amazing locations in eastern North Carolina, including Winterville near Pitt Community College, on Jarvis Street in uptown Greenville, and on Statensburg Road near the hospital. It's the best burger around, guaranteed. It's Bostick Sug Furniture's Lazy Boy Market Sample Sell-Off. We bought out an entire showroom of 100 one-of-a-kind pieces of Lazy Boy Furniture. Now we're selling it all at drastically reduced prices. Floor samples slashed an additional 50 to 70% off. This is a one-time opportunity to shop extreme sell-off prices on brand new Lazy Boy styles, recliners, power recliners, sectionals, and leather furniture, designer chairs, cocktail ottomans, and much more. Hurry! You will never, ever find Lazy Boy Furniture at such low, low prices again at Bostick Sug Furniture. Better ingredients, better pizza, better brace yourself because this right here is a Papa John's Papa Bowl. No crust, just piping hot toppings and melty cheese in an oven-baked bowl. Better ingredients, better pizza, now in a bowl, Papa John's. Hey, Pirate fans, brace yourself for the brand new Papa Bowls for only $7.99. The new Papa Bowls are an MVP move for game day or any day. Place your order online at PapaJohns.com and sign up for Papa Rewards. Papa John's, better ingredients, better pizza. Pizza. Go Pirates! Pirate Radio. You know, East Carolina deserves to go to Omaha. People should be worried about us. We're going to be really good, and I'm not afraid to say it on record. The voice of the Pirate Nation. You're listening to The Brian Bailey Show, powered by Greenville Utilities, providing reliable utility solutions to the Greenville region since 1905. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back on this Monday. Pirates fall at Tulane 24-9 down in New Orleans over the weekend. Next up, East Carolina taking on the Memphis Tigers at 730 for homecoming. Roy Tesh is the East Carolina defensive tackles coach, and he joins us from his office on campus today. Coach Tesh, first of all, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate the, the opportunity to be here. All right, Coach. When you look back at the tape of the Tulane game uh, defensively, obviously you guys wanted to shut down the run, and you did a great job of that. But when you see the tape, what were some of the things that stood out for you? I, I think, you know, we've got to do a little bit job, a better job of being us at times. There were some uh, unforced errors uh, that, we, that we brought on ourselves in, in some key situations that we've got to do a little bit better job managing not only as, as players but, but as coaches. Uh, and just really kind of focusing and honing back in on what makes us us and how we play the game. When you look at the game, Tulane and East Carolina, it was a close game in the third quarter. Pirates have the football deep inside Tulane territory. Uh, the offense th throws the interception, and from that point on, uh, Tulane just made a couple of big plays. Pratt, the quarterback, it, the, nobody really knew if he was going to play or not. The word was he probably was going to play. I think you guys as a defense prepared for him to play, and he was really good, wasn't he? Uh, yes, sir. We prepared for him to play. We we thought he would. He has a history of being a really, really tough kid. Uh, last year, uh, when we we played these guys, they played a murderer's row schedule before we got to them, and and he had been 
hit, tossed around and hammered uh, in that stretch and, and showed up and was toughing it out last year. And then this year was kind of the same deal. We knew he'd probably be in there because of the mindset that he brings in there. And, he, and he's a great quarterback. He can beat you with his feet, uh, throws a good ball, uh, is very smart about what he does with the ball, very careful with the ball. Uh, so, you know, he, he did a great job. At halftime, was one of the topics, you know, let's get some pressure on him internally, whether you have to blitz or whether you just uh, with with your defensive lineman, because it looked like early on in that third quarter you got some pressure. Uh, we did. I think always our mentality is, is stop the run and create more opportunities to rush the passer. If we, if we do a better job on our normal down situations there uh, in the interior and up front in the box, it, it allows Coach Harrell to really – uh, branch out a little bit with what he likes to do and, and what you know his game plan as far as putting pressure on the quarterback. Uh, so I think that was the mentality. It always is going in. Uh, you make a couple of adjustments and you keep doing your job. Tulane wins at 24-9 was the final. When you guys get back late Saturday night, you get back together with the team on Sunday. How was the team on Sunday? Uh, you know, disappointed, uh, but they, they adhere to the 24-hour rule. We watch the tape. We make corrections. Uh, we, we talk about the things that we need to do well, uh, that, that we did well, that we need to continue to do. We talk about the things that we need to fix, how to fix them, and what to do, and we start right away. Uh, and then you've got to move on uh, to the next game with preparation on a Sunday practice, a uh, big special teams day for us. Uh, so for us to be able to get in there and do the, the fundamentals of those and then start on uh, the next opponent uh, you know, with their base outlook and how we want to uh, start lining up and attacking it, uh, is, is what you got to do, and, and that's what those guys did. They showed up, and they got ready to go. You mentioned special teams a little bit. I know that's really frustrating for Coach Houston and for everybody on the staff. Uh, you know, it's almost like a, a one of those situations that if something bad can happen, maybe that it does. I think on the block field goal, it was actually a cadence change at the last second, and that kind of got everybody off kilter. Everybody wants to look at Owen whenever a kick is missed, but sometimes it's not always the kicker. Sometimes, obviously, it is. But, I mean, those special teams, you know, somehow they got to be correct. It, don't they? Well, but, you know, I, I've been a special teams coordinator before, and there's a lot of things that go into that. And I'm going to be real honest with you. There's a lot of things that go into that that I'm not privy to because I'm over there trying to block with, block the thing when they kick it. Uh, and, and so I've, I've got my hands full with that unit. Uh, and, and each individual coach that has a unit has got their hands full with what's going on uh, within it. But there's a lot of moving parts in those things. And, and each moving part, everybody's got to do their job. And when you struggle uh, in – any aspect, the football is the ultimate team game. And ten guys can do their job, and one guy can fall a little bit short, and it'll affect the entire play. Uh, so, you know, they block back in. we got to continue to push, uh, continue to keep doing our jobs uh, as coaches to get it better and as players to continue to do what's expected of us, and, and we'll get the job done. And that's exactly the point that, that I make all the time, that football, that's why I think so many of us love it so much, whether it's college, high school, professional. It's a sport where you've got 11 guys, and 11 guys have to be on the same page on every single play. And you see it every Sunday in the NFL. You see it on Saturdays in college. You see it on Fridays. You know, if one guy just doesn't come up with 100% of an effort or with 100% of his assignment, that something bad can happen. And it's, uh, it's really... It's one of the joys of the sport, but it's also, I guess, one of the the reasons that makes it so hard. You know, it's it's like the the movie League of Their Own when when uh, they they say you know if it, it's the hard that makes it great because if it was easy anybody could do it. Uh, correct, and it's it's a little bit different than, than the other sides of the ball. You get one shot, you get one opportunity. Uh, if we don't do real well on defense on first down, we play second down. Uh, if if they get a first down, then then we play first down again. Uh, if you mess up on a special team, then everyone knows about it. Uh, so, and, and it's the same thing on offense. You know, if you don't do real well on first down, then you get second down and, and so forth and so on, and you can punt. Uh, but when you're in a special team situation, you get one shot to get your job done, and Coach Dass has done a great job of reiterating that uh, over and over again to our guys, and, and we're moving forward. I know Coach Dallas takes care of the special teams, but as you said, a lot of you guys are involved with the special teams, and and, and it, it's kind of a combination effort of everybody getting together, putting their heads together. Uh, if you see something like a possible fake or something like that, I mean, it's a combination effort. It is, and you've got to have more than just one coach coaching it when you're on the field, uh, not only during the games, but also you know in practice and, and sharpening things up, and, and everyone is get, steps in there and, and does their part. Uh, to move forward with it and make sure we're getting done what we need to get done. 
Roy Tesh, the East Carolina defensive tackles coach, joining us to talk about the Tulane loss and to preview the Memphis game coming up again. Memphis, East Carolina, 7.30 kickoff. Uh, UCF and East Carolina the next week also a 7.30 kickoff. And then you got a couple of 8 o'clock kickoffs coming up, Coach. Do you guys like the night games? Uh, we're Apparently we're night owls. <laughs> apparently. That one's above my, my pay grade there as far as what time we start. I, I played Division three football. Uh, you know, the, the ball got put on the tee at 12 o'clock. <laughs> you know, about what, what radio station or what TV station it was on. So, at this point, you just kind of sit back, and, and wherever they tell you to go, that's where you go. All right. Do you changed position uh, as far as your coaching position goes? You, you were the bandits on outside linebackers coach in 19. You changed the tackles. What was that change like for you personally as a coach? Uh, it, I've coached a lot of different positions over the years. Uh, I, I joke with Coach Houston all the time. I, I'm a jack of all trades and a master of none, and I think he just kind of puts me you know, wherever he needs me at, at any point. Uh, but I, I've coached several to, on both sides of the ball. I was a running backs coach one time, a uh, long, long time ago, and coached the special team. So the transition uh, is you, you go where you're needed. You, you do what you know the team needs you to do, and, and so you pick it up and you run with it. You don't get much time to think about it. You've had a chance to coach with Coach Houston at five different places now. What, what's the, the the place besides East Carolina that was your favorite of the other four? James Madison, Citadel, Lenore, Ryan, and Brevard. Well, you know, it kind of depends on what, what you mean by favorite. If you say best weather, the Citadel was pretty good being down there at the beach. That's not bad. We won a lot of games at James Madison. Uh, so, that, you know, winning is fun. Uh, and, and so... You know, Lenore Ryan is a place that, that I might consider home a little bit. My daughter was born there, uh, which was my wife, Kim, and I's first child there. Uh, she's from Hickory. My wife is. Uh, so that's kind of like a home place. And, and Brevard was a, the place where we first met uh, a long time ago, uh, back in 2006, and started football with all the trials and tribulations of that. So I, I think each one of those places is a little bit different. There's some things you would uh, love to do again at, at each one of those places to some things you'd say no thanks for that's for certain <laughs> well you've coached with coach houston so many stops as we said when after a game when you lose a game and you get together as a staff nobody w- likes to lose obviously that's just one of the things that makes it you know everybody's competitive you guys are in a competition business you, you know winning is the the only thing but how is coach houston in a staff meeting after a loss goal oriented what went wrong? How do we get it fixed? How do we move forward? How do we coach our kids to be better? He starts you know, every meeting more. He's a thumb pointer. He's not a finger pointer at all, meaning he, he wants to, starts with himself. What can I do better? And then he trickles it down and starts asking for ideas. This is where we need to be better. How do we get it done? Uh, and, and you go down the list of the problems that you have, and you get them fixed one by one. And then you sit down, and you have a plan of attack for you know, how to get it done during your practice scenario so that you're tip-top and ready to go for the next week. Uh, so I, I think that he is – He's obviously everyone's disappointed when you lose. Uh, you've got to sit down and fix it. Uh, and then you've got to be upbeat and you've got to push yourself uh, because you can't let one cost you the next one as far as your mentality. Uh, so you've got to move on, uh, and, and he does a great job of leading us down that path. And that's the old saying, you can't let one loss turn into two. And so East Carolina trying to bounce back against the Memphis Tigers. Uh, East Carolina beat Memphis last year. That was one of the, the big wins on the road last year and propelled East Carolina to uh, bowl eligibility. Of course, uh, the military bowl, we all spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day away from home, and then uh, the game was canceled uh, shortly thereafter. So we didn't get a chance to play in the bowl game. As a coach, how disappointing was that for you? It was disappointing. That was the, the first bowl game that I would have had to uh, be able to coach in there. I've coached in a lot of playoff games over the years and a couple of national championship games, but never a bowl game. Uh, so there was an excitement for that. I, I think more of my heart was broken for our kids, uh, specifically the seniors uh, who didn't get a chance to come back. No, we didn't have very many of them, but you know those, those guys uh, that put everything into that last month, almost of preparation, and, and, and all the players who spent time away from their families on Christmas, uh, you know, my, my kids and my wife jumped in the car and drove up. Uh, so they were at least in the hotel when we did that. Some of those guys, folks were in Texas and things of that nature and, and couldn't uh, spend time with their families. And then to have it all canceled, that, my heart was really broken for them. Yeah, for, especially for the players. All right, take us, uh, speaking of the players, into your room a little bit. Some of the guys you work with on a daily basis and, and kind of tell us where they're at this season so far. Well, we've got, some, we've, we've got a lot of guys that have played. 
Uh, I think we played six defensive tackles in, in the last game, and uh, we've had some guys get dinged up here, there, yonder, and, and had some other bodies been in there. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how many we've had uh, rotating in and out, but it's close to eight uh, in just the two interior tackle positions. You start counting the, the edge guys out there that Coach Dallas works with, uh, then you, your number goes up a little bit. But a guy that's always been a staple for us has been Elijah Morris. Uh, he's played two different positions in the interior. He's been a little time in the, at the tackle position uh, here most recently and then gone to nose guard uh, here, there, and under. He's a solid guy. He's continuing to work every day, really a, a big leader in the room. Uh, Deontay Johnson uh, is a guy who played really, you know, really well, worked his rear end off over the summertime and over the spring uh, to really change his body. Uh, had a lot of significant reps in the first game of the year. Uh, got dinged up uh, and then made it back uh, here recently. So he's a, he's a great leader in our room, real physical young man. And always got a big smile on his face. Be one of the angriest guys we've got on the team uh, between the lines and the whistles. He's a, he's a smiling, happy guy. Uh, you know, as you, as you roll down through there, uh, Chandre Mims uh, did a great job for us uh, in the last game. He's the transfer from Charleston Southern there. It's really you know, he's from right down the street, so every time he walks into the stadium there uh, here, on, here on campus in Daddy Ficklin, uh, he's excited to be a part of, of what we're doing and, and works his butt off, really brings a work ethic uh, to the room. And then a, a bright star uh, that we've had here, J.D. Lampley, great young man, uh, really probably played a, a, one of his best games of the year uh, in the last one there. Uh, had some pressures on the quarterback, did well in the run game, really moved well side to side and ran to the ball. Uh, did some really good things. And, and, you know, you've had one or two other guys in there, big Jason Shuford uh, rotating in and out at nose guard in the past game. And then Rick DeBrew uh, made, uh, you know, came in there and, and really got in some uh, good reps uh, in the pass rush uh, in the last game too. Didn't necessarily make a stat there, but had a couple quarterback hits uh, and, and really, you know, frustrated them at times. So uh, we've, we've rotated a lot of bodies, uh, a lot of great young guys. There's, you know, we've got, Two guys down on the scout team right now that are that are working their butt off, uh, and, and we may try to get them in the game, you know, before uh, the end of the year with the four game freshman rule. So a lot of a lot of good bodies in there, a lot of good young men uh, that come together and they work hard every day. You know, you think of Elijah Morris and what a great story he's been all year. And I thought he really got the short end of the stick in the Navy game when he got called on that big sack for targeting. Uh, you know, how did he take that? Because I'm sure he was really upset. He, you know, when you're thinking about stopping Navy anyway, and you, and you lose a, a, just a guy who clogs the middle up so well like he does, I mean, that really hurt the Pirate cause that night, didn't it? it well, it, it didn't help. And he took it about like probably every Pirate fan did. Yeah. Uh, with it and and i wear purple and gold so anytime they throw a yellow flag on us i think it's wrong uh but uh you know it, when you go back and you watch the tape you, you teach off of it and you move on and you try to correct it so it doesn't happen again uh and and i think he's learned from that experience whether he agreed with it or not uh you know it is what it was and and we know how to prevent it from here on moving out you've seen the tape then and, and many people t- they, we all talked about it right after it happened but what is one of the things that he should have maybe done differently is it it, with the head as far as where he he the head has to go to the opponent's shoulder or or to his chest what 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 does he have to do differently so you you have a a strike zone uh, on a quarterback and then you also the big emphasis for this year is the the crown of the helmet uh, is used as a a battering ram or a spear there which has always been a rule uh, but they've really made that an emphasis there and, and what you've got to do is aim for a point that's really below the shoulders but above the, the knees because quarterbacks are protected in the pocket uh, on low blows uh, as well. So you've got a window in there uh, that's really right around the sternum that you've got to target. And that, well, well, not target, but you've got to aim for uh, when, you, when you're going to tackle him so that if he slides one way or the other or something happens, uh, you're, you're hitting him in a legal area. So it's a small window, but you've got to be right. It is, and it's it's controversial week in and week out when you look at tape. What is targeting? What isn't targeting? And you just you want the play to be safe, the players to be safe. Obviously, we all want that. Nobody wants because you see some targeting, and you're like, hey, that's everybody in the stadium. Why do you have to review it because that's targeting? But sometimes you see something like that, and it's just a, and that was a big play in that game because all of a sudden Navy would, would have been punting out of their own end zone, and they ended up you know with good field position because of that penalty. But it was just unfortunate that it happened. 
uh, in that situation, and he was out for the rest of the game. Uh, when you look at at the Memphis Tigers uh, coming to town this week, Memphis coming off of a big loss as well from last week. Uh, that was a bizarre game last week for the Tigers, wasn't it? Well, it was a, a very exciting game. Uh, I'll tell you that. They, they went back and forth. You had two teams really battle it out. Uh, to get two teams that can be extremely explosive. Uh, Memphis has got a great quarterback. Uh, he can run. He can throw. They've got explosive skill kids uh, that can get loose on you in a hurry, and they've got some guys up front uh, that are that are extremely large uh, and some guys up front that are extremely athletic. they got a good mix in there. So they're, they're a, they can be a potent offense, uh, and, and they can get the job done. And then uh, defensively, I haven't watched much of them, uh, but I would assume going back and forth with Houston like they did that, that they can get it done there as well. When you think about last year's game that came down to the uh, missed two-point conversion for the Tigers, but what do you remember about their offense and, and trying to stop them last year? Uh, well, <laughs> I remember exactly what we just said. They're, they're, they're almost similar in that they're very, very explosive. they got skilled kids that can really run, uh, and you've got to have uh, the ability to be able to, to cover them. Uh, and you get to have the ability to be able to help and cover them because they have guys that can really, really stretch the field. Uh, and they, they are physical up front. Uh, they got a great offensive line coach uh, who does a phenomenal job for them there. Uh, and, and they put an emphasis on scoring and they put an emphasis on uh, you know, really getting the job done offensively. So I can, I can remember uh, you know, them stretching the field a good bit last year. Uh, I can remember you know, uh, us having to be very, very diligent because their quarterback can run, he can take off vertically on you in a hurry, and he did uh, do that to us a couple times. Uh, so we, we've got some of the same problems that we had last year, and they did well against us last year. It came down, like you said, to the last play of the two-point conversion. So we've got our hands full again this week. When you have a quarterback like that, it, it, sometimes does Blake put in like a spy or someone like that to keep an eye on, on him running the football? Is that part of the defensive philosophy? There, there, yes, sir. There, there's all kinds of ways to do it. I'll different calls have different guys who are assigned uh, to, to that job. And, and then you've got to match up a guy that can, that may be assigned to him that can actually get him. Uh, you know, we, and we've had some, some instances in the past as well, where, uh, you know, we've had some scrambling quarterbacks. So you got to have a, there, there's plenty of pages in the playbook on how to do it. And then we've got to go out and practice it and, and prepare for it. Roy Tess, the defensive tackles coach for East Carolina, as we wrap things up with him. Coach, what do you do on a day like today? The players are off. This is your game planning type day. Take us through your day. Uh, do you guys look at film individually, then get with Coach Harold to try to put in your game plan? You put all of that in, I would think, going into practice on Tuesday. A uh, little bit of both. We get here really early. Uh, got up early this morning. Get in here, get you a cup of coffee, did a little Bible study, and then we sat down as a defensive uh, uh, coaching staff uh, watched the game together. Uh, then we split up, uh, did some individual study that, that we have going on. Uh, each one of us has, a, has an individual area that we look at, uh, you know, centrally. And, and then we come back together. We came back together right here uh, and, and did a little bit more as far as starting to put a game plan together uh, for what we've been studying. We'll come back this afternoon. Uh, we've got some stuff that we've got to do that's outside of football related. We'll have an academic meeting because academics are important. Uh, then we'll have a staff meeting to uh, so make sure we're all on the same page moving forward, and then we'll get back together, and it'll be a late night tonight as we put this thing together. It's homecoming coming up this weekend. Uh, for the players, I don't know if they really have a whole lot to do with it. It's much more about the fans, the alumni coming back, uh, that kind of thing. But uh, were you the homecoming king back when you were playing? You know better than that. <laughs> <laughs> and ask. <laughs> but, but, but it's a completely di it's a different type of week for the for you know for the alums to come back and all that kind of thing. But uh, for the players, it's pretty much a normal week, isn't it? Yes, sir. And, and you've got to you've got to make sure that it is a normal week as far as it, we've got the most important game of the year coming up because it's the next game and, and homecoming is like you said for the fans uh, for for us. Uh, and, and for the alumni, for us, when we come to the stadium, it, it's about getting the job done. Uh, so as we approach the week, I think our guys will be locked into that uh, and, and be trying to move forward. All right, Coach, good luck this week. East Carolina and Memphis, 730 kickoff coming up at Dowdy Ficklin Stadium. Uh, we certainly appreciate your time on this Monday. I know how precious it is, especially on a Monday. But we appreciate you being on. As always, you did a great job. And we look forward to the game coming up Saturday night. Well, thank you, sir.
Appreciate it. Roy Tesh, defensive tackles coach at East Carolina, joining us. We'll take a commercial break right now. Coming up next, he's a member of the 2022 Hall of Fame class at East Carolina, the former Pirate quarterback Marcus Crandall. You'll enjoy hearing from Marcus Crandall. That's coming up next as the Brian Bailey Show continues on this Monday after this. This is Jeff Charles, and this is a Pirate Radio Sports Break, presented by Ron Ayers Motorsports, Highway 11, north of the airport in Greenville. The Panthers dropped to 1-4 and four after a 37-15 loss to the 49ers in San Francisco's first road win of the season. The Washington Commanders are also 1-4 and four after a 21-17 loss to Tennessee. The Cowboys are 4-1 and one as Dallas gets by the Rams 22-10. The Eagles are 5-0 and oh after a 20-17 victory over the Cardinals. Philadelphia is the lone undefeated team in the NFL. In a National League wild card matchup, the Padres eliminated the Mets, winning 6 to nothing. Joe Musgrove went seven innings, allowing just one hit. The AP Top 25 is out. Georgia is back at number one. Ohio State two. Alabama third. Clemson four. Michigan five. Tennessee is sixth. USC is seventh. Oklahoma State is eighth. And ECU is home Saturday night at 7.30, hosting Memphis. This has been a Pirate Radio Sports Break. Sear Chop House is Greenville's only true chop house. We're open seven days a week. Seared combines a remarkable menu with an unrivaled atmosphere. Lunch or dinner at Seared is a quality driven experience where we highlight a thoughtful approach to locally sourced ingredients and hearty flavor rich cuisine. We're firing up the grill at Seared, Greenville's only true chop house located on Fire Tower Road at Bell's Fork. Come see us at Seared seven days a week. I'm Michael Vaughn with East Coast Grading and Utilities. Many of you know my dad, David Vaughn, and his work in putting in subdivisions all over Pirate Nation. But East Coast Grading and Utilities is not just for those type of big jobs. We're here for the homeowners, whether it's concrete, driveways, hauling rock or sand, whatever you need, East Coast Grading and Utilities can get the job done. Call us at 252-531-7494 or check us out on Facebook at East Coast Grading and Utilities. Dear past, present, and future football watchers, you know why we're here. The football season is back! Woo! That means those pregame barbecues with an ice-cold Pepsi? Totally back! Your perfectly placed football watching corner seat, back and comfy as ever. 18 Sundays of touchdown scoring, Hail Mary throwing, ice-cold Pepsi flowing football action? You better believe it's back! And since that's too amazing to miss a single second's worth, Pepsi is officially giving you permission to always put football first. And when we say always, we mean always. Like when your lawn is looking less like a lawn and more like a jungle. If the game's on, then the lawnmower ain't. And those gutters you haven't cleaned? Today is not their day. Or maybe those in-laws are back in town. Well, better hope they're football fans because your Sunday is completely booked. Long story short, crack open a Pepsi and don't let anything get between you and your football watching. With love, Pepsi, made for football watching. Ah, that's what I like. Pirate Radio. We're going to be bigger, faster, stronger, and older. That's always a good combination. The voice of the Pirate Nation. You're listening to The Brian Bailey Show, powered by Greenville Utilities. Community-owned utilities mean local control, low rates, and high reliability. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back on this Monday. Joining us now, he's a member of the East Carolina Hall of Fame class of 2022. He goes in coming up on Friday night. He is the former East Carolina quarterback, Marcus Crandall, from the mid-'90s, and uh, he's the former Roanoke High School star. Robertsonville, Roanoke, not even a school anymore. We've joked about that before in the past, but Marcus Crandall joins us right now. And, uh, Marcus, what does it mean to you to go into the East Carolina Hall of Fame? It means a lot, Brian. It means um, that all your hard work is being recognized uh, for your accomplishments uh, there. And um, whenever you have something like that, it's just uh, just uh, a wealth of appreciation for the fans that supported me and the coaches that I played under and teammates that I played with and uh, and family that support as well. So uh, this is the deal where everybody can celebrate and uh it's just an awesome feeling, man. It's still a little bit surreal at the moment, but uh, I'm sure to hit home on Friday. 
It's going to be a big night Friday night. It'll be my honor and privilege to uh, MC the Hall of Fame banquet. So I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to seeing you again, of course. Take us back to your days in high school. Now, you played for a 1A high school, you know, Roanoke High School, the Redskins. Uh, I don't know, you know, your recruitment. I remember hearing a little bit about it because we covered you guys almost week in and week out because you were so good and your team was good. But but take us through your recruitment uh, from other schools and East Carolina, why you decided to go to East Carolina. Man, it, that was a, it was an interesting process. You know, as as you know, coming from a small town uh, <laughs> where not many people knew where we were, and uh, I talk I talk to our players about this right now here at Livingstone College um, in regards to you know I was an option quarterback and uh, and so play both ways option quarterback and played free safety as well. Uh, so just an athlete all around, uh, played multiple sports and um, and it was just a, a blessing to be recognized and and have. You know, East Carolina, along with uh, other schools, come out and, and find someone from a small town like that, such as ours at Roanoke. And um, and, and really, the process was, was was pretty interesting in regards to I was a huge UNC fan, Chapel Hill, Tar Heel fan uh, growing up for basketball. And then I loved all the other <laughs> colleges uh, around the world, around the U.S. for, for football. But uh, I really wanted to go to UNC. Um, to play football and and uh, but I started getting letters from all around, um, from all over the East Coast to the West Coast uh, initially, and then I kind of narrowed it down by my senior year, um, and kind of pretty much based it upon a few different things. And playing quarterback was one of them, and uh, the next one was being close to home, and so. Uh, throughout that process, most teams or most colleges wanted me to play defensive back. Um, my 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 ambition and goals was to you know be the best quarterback that I could be, and uh, if given the opportunity, and uh, East Carolina proved to be the only one that was going to give me that opportunity. And you took advantage of that opportunity. I mean, you know, you came in and, and you won the starting job in 93 as a freshman. Uh, take us back to September the 18th because your career, it could have ended that day. I mean, I remember being on the sideline. I heard the injury. I knew how, how really horrific that it was. And you know, the, the fact that you were able to bounce back from that and come back and have the career that you had is just amazing. And you probably should have been in the Hall of Fame years earlier just because of of the way you were able to come back, but but how disappointing was it to get hurt after all the hard work you put in to win the starting job that year? Oh, it was very difficult. It was very difficult. I mean, it um, you know, you, if you look at today's society and athletes and, and people in general, you know, um, a lot of people struggle with those kind of things as far as, you know, adversity hitting and not being able to overcome. Um, I, I, I really put my strength in you know, my, my faith and what I believe in and more so nowadays uh, in expressing it. But I, I really uh, did a lot of praying. Uh, and, and I tell people this, that, you know, the first time I stepped on that field uh, for the first game, I, I kneeled down and said a prayer. And uh, not knowing what was <laughs> ahead of me in regards to, you know, the overcoming and trials and tribulation that I was about, about to face. And so, um, it, you know, I really just had to dig down deep and, and pray and uh and ask for strength and and getting back uh, the mental aspect of it as far as, you know, uh, as I mentioned, I wanted to be uh, a quarterback and then try to make it as far as I could. And so at that time, you know, the thought flashed through my head that it was pretty much over. Um, and then especially after the doctor said probably it was over as well. So, uh, But it was an uplifting moment um, when Coach Logan came in uh, at the hospital there and had a, had a word with me. And he just said, you know, when you get back, all right, you, you're going to be the starting quarterback. And so that was the first motivation in regards to getting back. You know, I, I worked hard. And I thank our training staff for, for all the hard work that they put in to help me get there, uh, to get back on the field, and my teammates as well that pushed me. 
it was a dislocated ankle and a fractured fibula. It was a, just, a, like I said, a horrific injury. Uh, did, you, did you ever talk to the, to the player? Emil Ekior was the, the player that it was a horse collar type tackle uh, late. There were there were fans. I remember it very well. The fans just went absolutely crazy as far as and, you know, the message boards and that kind of thing. After that, just to call in shows. And it was everybody was really just mad at the world because of this thing happening. Did you guys ever talk? No, I, no, I didn't. I didn't. And I, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any animosity towards him. Um, I, you know, I, knowing it was a, a, a dirty hit or, or bad play or bad decision on his part, I, I had no animosity. I mean, I, I was just more upset that I was injured and not being able to be out there with my teammates. And uh, every day I had to experience that and watching them get on the field and, and, and play football. Um, and I wanted to be out there with them. You know, just watching practice was, you know, it was just um, almost depressing, right? And so uh, being out there watching them or actually just watching from inside <laughs> as I was studying as they were practicing. So, uh, yeah, just a lot of different things that uh, that went on through there, through my mind. But uh, that, that wasn't uh, – the animosity or, or anger towards him was, it was definitely far removed from my mindset. It was uh, more just, all right, how am I going to get back on this field? Pirates went two and nine that year without Marcus Crandall. East Carolina bounced back. Now, when did you know as part of your rehab process that you would be able to come back and you would be able to play and play effectively? Was there, there a shining moment during that rehab process that you thought, Hey, I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to be back. Yeah, it was probably the first time I stepped on the field and and, um, and I ran for the first time. And again, I, I take this back to you know one of my teammates and hopefully uh, one day to see him uh, be in the Hall of Fame as well, Morris Foreman. Um, he was one of the first person that came on the sideline with me and and ran across the field and back. And uh, it was very painful. Um, it was my first time out there, and, uh, you know, I did see the light because I was unsure if I'd be able to run again uh, to that nature, and I did it. And uh, he pushed me, uh, you know, just just the little things that, <laughs> you know, he would say uh, to help me get through. And uh, I actually was talking to our guys uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I that one of the <laughs> – one of his phrases kind of came through my head as I was talking to him. I had to chuckle. Uh, but um, at that moment, I just I just realized that I could I could definitely make it and uh, get back uh, through the help uh, through the help of my teammates uh, pushing me and and of course through the strength of God. You know, you think about that, it almost brings a tear to your eye because uh, I remember the movie Brian's Song, and there's a scene in, in that movie where uh, Brian Piccolo and Gail Sayers are running together, and, you know, and, and that was the story. You know, Brian Piccolo had cancer, and, and you know, they were best of friends, a black, and a, you know, black player and a white player, and just, just that story was just so heartwarming. Just to hear Morris Foreman, the late Morris Foreman, just what, what a great guy, what a great pirate player he was. I mean, he was one of those guys that always found the football, despite the fact that he was on on defense he still found it yep yeah absolutely man he was an extraordinary player and uh just had a had that innate ability to find the football like you said and uh no matter where it was and uh he just uh, you know he was one of the guys that you know that inspired me to go to ecu as well and so uh becoming teammates having you know played against him in in high school and so then we became one <laughs> Tell you what, he was he was an outstanding pirate, and uh, we certainly miss him for sure. East Carolina goes to back to back Liberty Bowls in Memphis, Tennessee. The Pirates lose thirty to nothing to a really good Illinois football team in '94, and in '95, East Carolina gets the big 1913 win over the Stanford Cardinal. What do you remember about going to Memphis for those Liberty Bowls? Oh man, Oof. it was a lot. I mean, that first one going against Illinois. You know, we had toured the uh, facilities and, and uh, you know, all the things that go along with uh, being at a bowl game and all the extracurricular activities, um, you know, just everything. We just soaked it up, and and it was nice and, you know, pretty decent weather. <laughs> and then game day, it, was, it just got cold on us. And, um, you know, for me personally, it was just my performance. It was one of the worst performances I ever had. 
and um, you know, as far as you know, throwing the football and and uh, helping lead my team, and so um, it wasn't it wasn't a good outcome, and and of course, uh, like I said, it it just for me personally, uh, it wasn't good enough. It wasn't good enough, and so um, it inspired me for the next one. It inspired me for the next one to uh, to get back there for one uh, because we were Conference USA. Uh, the alliance at that time, so we started the Conference USA uh, Liberty Bowl, and um, just the opportunity to be in that position as well, and then to get back, fight hard to get back, um, and then once we got there, you know, just just playing more of a role of you know we had a great defense, and my job was to you know going against a great defense uh, on the other side was to keep ourselves in position, um, make plays. But keep ourselves in a position to to win a football game at all costs. I tell you the things I remember about Memphis, you, you know, because you think back to the '91 season, and that of course was the dream season. East Carolina wins the Peach Bowl over North Carolina State, finishes ninth in the country. But but those Liberty Bowls, and even the ones that we played in the mid 2000s, I mean, Memphis and the Liberty Bowl do a great job with that bowl and the big parades that they had. And I don't know if you had a chance to even see some of those, but the crowds, you know, right there on uh, Beale Street, just just were just thousands of people lined up. And uh, it was just really just a neat bowl type atmosphere. Even though the Pirates lost the first time, it came back the second year. You guys avenged that loss with that win over Stanford. And as you said, the Stanford game was more of a defensive struggle. I still say Darren and David Hart, they both tell everybody that they had to pick six in that game, don't they? (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, But, yes, they they, they did an extraordinary job, Memphis did, in putting on a, a great show for the fans. Uh, and like you said, we didn't, as players, I know I didn't uh, have a chance to see that part, but, you know, just hearing everything from the fans uh, and, and, and the uh, superb food that they had as well that uh, Memphis brings <laughs> to the table, uh, which we did have a, a chance to, to get a taste of. Uh, yeah, it was just it was just a good experience overall. And, uh, I'm, just, I'm just thankful for the opportunity to get there twice and, and then, you know, to win the one that we won against Stanford. And then in 96, Pirates go 8-3, and three, uh, did not go to a bowl game that year. I guess if you look at uh, the season, the finale beating State 50-29, to 29, uh, that was pretty much the bowl win. Yeah, it was. It was a, it was a big game. Uh, we hadn't played NC State since the Peach Bowl. Um, and, you know, going in Charlotte and uh, playing them on neutral territory. Uh, the, the thing about that one is that I, I wasn't able to play. And so I, I tried hard to get back because I had hurt my knee. Uh, my senior year, and that was my senior year, and uh, wasn't able to play. Uh, but it was it was so exciting to to watch my teammates go out there and and uh, in a neutral site and have an abundance amount of fans there to support us uh, to go there and win that game against NC State. Was that the Larry Shannon bowl when he when he got the touchdown catch and he <laughs> took the towel out and waved it around? <laughs> Uh, absolutely, it was. Yeah, I thought so. That was yeah. that was absolutely classic. <laughs> he went down in his drawers and found that towel and went waving it around. And I so I thought Coach Logan was going to have a coronary right there on the sideline. But that was <laughs> that was good fun as well uh, in 1996. But as you said, you missed the finale that year with that banged up knee. Now you you go into the pros before we go into your your CFL days. What kind of shot did you have in the NFL? And then uh, the decision to go to the CFL. You know, I um, went through the draft. Uh, I, I was invited to the combine. Went to there. Went there. But uh, overall, my knee wasn't ready. I I didn't run the fastest time. I didn't have confidence in it um, and, and running my drills. Um, so I wasn't drafted. Uh, and then I actually didn't get any calls until after I got up to the CFL, um, and I had already signed a contract. And so. Um, I just let everything play out um, and uh, just spent my three years up there in, in, in Canada at the or with the Edmonton uh, at that time, Edmonton Eskimos, now Edmonton Elks um, in 97 and uh, sat up there and, and backed up. Uh, I was a third string quarterback there uh, for the first year and uh and second year and then um my opportunity came uh, a few times in uh 1999 and uh was able to get some experience and then 
you know, I did get some uh, some calls from the NFL, and after that season, and ended up signing with the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, that's when I played in the XFL. Uh, sorry, the uh, NFL Europe, and so they sent me over to Scotland. Played there for a year. Had a had a pretty good successful um, year there in the in the CF. Uh, sorry, in the uh, NFL Europe with the Scottish Claymores. Uh, we went to the bowl game there. We lost in the championship. And then um, I set out for a year pretty much after I came back and got released by Kansas City, went to Green Bay's camp for the duration, uh, and then just sat out of football until the following year. That's when I went to the XFL. You go to the XFL, then you get back the uh, Stampeders, and you lead them to a championship, and you're the Great Cup MVP. Yeah, I mean that was um, it was it was an awesome time in regards to you know they were in a rebuilding uh, situation as well. You know they they've been having a number of great teams, and then that year actually you had some retirees, guys retiring, uh, guys moving on. Um, so it was a pretty interesting time there as well, going through that transition of what they were trying to build, uh, or what we were trying to build, I should say, because I was a part of it and. Uh, you know, we had an up and down season. I actually didn't win the starting job. I I, um, I played the first game due to a thumb injury by our, uh, by our uh, starting quarterback that was named that, that for that game. And then after that, I mean, I played for uh, up until um, early September. And then I got hurt and was out for a number of weeks and then came back at the end of the season. We're in pretty much um, – we're in, a, we're in a go home situations, and we were able to pull off. Uh, I'm not sure it's about three or four of the last uh, few games uh, to make it to the playoffs, and then then had an outstanding. Uh, we offensively and defensively had, you know, just uh, outstanding games uh, consecutively in regards to, you know, getting to the Grey Cup. Um, defense doing what they had to do, and then offensively we put up points, and then didn't turn the ball over all the things that you need to do to win games championships in 2001 with the stampeders and 2007 with the rough riders so uh two uh, great cup championships uh, under the belt for marcus crandall you finally uh you get out of football as a player but then you go into coaching and you stayed in the cfl didn't you yes i did i actually was released um in 2008 from the saskatchewan rough riders and then that following year uh after the season was over, the head coach asked me if I would uh, come on and be a guest coach. And then I was a guest coach for uh, training camp. And then after training camp, he asked if I could stay on as a part-time coach. And uh, I, 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 I said yes. Uh, but when I took the opportunity, it wasn't to be part-time. So I was there all the time. <laughs> they probably got tired of me. Uh, so I did all the little things that um, to you know to, to make myself – uh, as a viable part of or piece to the puzzle for them. And, uh, you know, the, the little things as far as, you know, getting helping getting the defense ready, uh, helping get the offense ready, all little things of sharing uh, information with everybody to um, to help us be successful and just play the role. And, um, and I learned a lot during that time as far as, you know, offensively and defensively talking to everyone. Uh, and then I became a – running backs coach after that after helping assisting with the quarterbacks and then i became a running backs coach the next year um, and then i got the opportunity to become an oc after that and went back to the team where i started from in the cfl which was the edmonton eskimos now elks yeah as a coordinator how do you like being a coordinator because you're a coordinator now with uh, livingstone and the blue bears uh how do you like being an offensive coordinator you know, I, I love it. I love it. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to um, to get enthralled in the game. Uh, you know, you, you look at the offense and you look at how you can set your team up to be successful in any kind of way as possible. Uh, there's a lot to it. <laughs> uh, coaching college football is a lot different because of the time constraints. Um, and so... Uh, it's, 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 it's challenging because we are actually a, a small college and we don't have the uh, facilities. We don't have a lot of the things that you need to 
to be the top. And so, but we're here, uh, we're, we're trying to coach our guys up or, or um, be a role model for them to, you know, no complaints, just do what you got to do and uh, take advantage of the opportunity, uh, work with what you have and try to win football games. And, and I think uh, we have a, an amazing attitude with that approach and um, guys are kind of catching on and, and feeling feeling the change that we've been uh, pretty much stressing since uh, we all got here. And you've pretty much uh, you've gotten into the podcast world as well, haven't you? Yeah, I did. And, um, you know, up until I took this job, or actually right before I took it, because uh, it, it was one of those things where, you know, I, I kind of it's, it's pretty interesting, Brian. Like I said, I, I, I've become more spiritual and uh, kind of listening to uh, that spirit in me. And um, something told me just kind of, you know, just, just relax and, and uh, step away for a little bit. So I kind of start falling back on it. And then, lo and behold, I get a call for this opportunity. And so uh, I slowed my life down, and uh, and this is where it led me to. And so I just got to uh, continue um, doing that for one, you know, and uh, paying homage to my to my heavenly Father, and uh, and really focusing in on that relationship first, and then let everything else come. Well, Marcus, you're an outstanding young man. You've been that way since I've known you way back in those days of Roanoke High School. And I would think there's a guy from a 1A high school that, that did so much that you, that you have done at East Carolina and in your pro, professional career with the CFL and, and now at Livingstone, a smaller type school that, you know, you kind of, that's probably a pretty good fit for Marcus Crandall. It, it really is. It really is. It, um, you know, like you just said, it's, um, you know, the city of Salisbury is not, or is not that big. And so, um, yeah, it reminds me of home in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I've been focusing on my craft and trying to get better every day to try to help these young men, uh, be successful along with the other coaches. And so, uh, to put them in the best position possible to hit the field on Saturday, Saturday and, uh, and win football games and, yeah, it, 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 I, I truly believe that God has me, has me here for a reason. Um, I'm just going to, you know, take everything in, uh, take it one day at a time, one step at a time, and uh, go from there. Marcus Crandall, the former Pirate quarterback, and he is one of the members of the Hall of Fame class of 2022 for East Carolina. Marcus, thank you so much for your time on this Monday. We look forward to seeing you coming up on Friday night for your induction. That's going to be a big night for you, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I, I'm, I'm very thankful for the uh, Hall of Fame committee um, and uh, John Gilbert, um, everyone who was involved in, in this process to, to help me get here. And uh, thank you as well, Brian, for your coverage throughout the years of my uh, career at ECU. I appreciate you guys. We appreciate you, Marcus Crandall, joining us here on the Brian Bailey Show. Marcus, we will see you coming up on Friday night. We'll take a commercial break right now. We'll come back. We'll wrap up this edition of the Brian Bailey Show right after this. It's bow time. The Mumfest concert featuring CMA New Artist of the Year, Jimmy Allen, is coming. Give you my best shot. Join Bojangles Friday, October 14th at Lawson Creek Park in Newburgh for Jimmy Allen. Down home. Oh, you know mama's still cooking and down home. Gates open at 4.30. Coolers are not allowed. The Mumfest concert Friday, October 14th at Lawson Creek Park in Newburgh. For tickets and info, go to mumfest.com. Mumfest.com. It's bow time. Be sure to check out David Price Construction for all of your commercial or custom residential renovation and building needs. Run by ECU alumni, David Price Construction specializes in commercial projects, maintenance on facilities, and large-scale residential renovations and additions. Proud to be voted the Remodeler of the Year by the Home Builders Association of Raleigh-Wake County in 2018 and Best Business Commercial Remodel Project winner for 2020. David Price Construction, the proud ECU Home Services Partner. The Rick House is Eastern North Carolina's premier American-style restaurant in Bourbon Bar. Join us at the Rick House for mouth-watering steaks and made-from-scratch pastas. Check out the 16-ounce cowboy steak or the seafood delight pasta. Join us for our legendary brunch on Sundays from 10 to 2. The Rick House can feed your larger crowds with off-site catering and room for 125 in our adjacent banquet hall. The Rick House, American Provisions and Spirits, 710 Red Banks Road, beside the bowling alley in Greenville. 
tired and sluggish, down in the dumps, or do you just have the blahs? Well, maybe you need to hydrate. Revive Health and Wellness offers IV hydration, which can help you with lack of energy, improve your mood, assist with immunity, and even fix a hangover. Call today to set up an appointment at 350-1805. Locally owned and operated by Samantha Casper, Revive Health and Wellness has a new location and is ready to serve you. Stop by at 2459 Emerald Place in Greenville or go online at revivehealthwellness.org. This is Holt Nailers. I've been eating at Parker's Barbecue since I was a kid. Now, all these years later, I still love to eat at Parker's. In fact, I love it so much, I bring my entire offensive line with me. They protect me, and I look out for them with great food from Parker's Barbecue. So whether you bring the team like me or just your friends and family, the awesome barbecue, chicken, and seafood at Parker's is a win every time. Parker's Barbecue, where they always treat you like family. Your vehicle is a big part of your life. That's why you should trust the team at Greenville Auto World for all your vehicle needs. Greenville Auto World believes in fair prices, superior service, and treating customers right. Visit GreenvilleAutoWorld.net to see their fully stocked inventory of SUVs, trucks, and cars. Need a lift kit, custom rims, or wheels? Greenville Auto World can upgrade your vehicle today. For sales or service, visit Greenville Auto World on Highway 43 in Greenville. the best burgers around everyone loves a thick juicy and fresh burger tiebreakers in greenville plus the all-new tiebreakers in winterville do real burgers better than anybody so don't just go to any burger themed restaurant chain it's time to break the chain and eat local tiebreakers real burgers at its best everybody loves burgers this is ECU assistant football coach Roy Tesh, and you're listening to Pirate Radio, the voice of the Pirate Nation. You're listening to The Brian Bailey Show, powered by Greenville Utilities. Community-owned utilities mean local control, low rates, and high reliability. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back as we wrap up this edition of The Brian Bailey Show on this Monday. East Carolina and Memphis set for a 7.30 kickoff coming up on Saturday night at Dowdy Picklin Stadium for homecoming. It's also Hall of Fame weekend. The UCF game against East Carolina is also a 7.30 start a week from this Saturday. So back-to-back 7.30 starts for East Carolina Pirate football. News from today, Matt Rule fired as the head coach of the Carolina Panthers. The Panthers off to just a horrible start, and Matt Rule is out. Interesting side note here, he is owed $834,000 per month for the next 48 months. Do you think he could live off of that? $834,000 per month for the next 48 months uh, due to Matt Rule, the former head football coach of the Carolina Panthers. That's not bad money if you can find a job like that to get it and lose it. And he was fired today by the Panthers. All right, Tulane beat East Carolina 24-9 last week. East Carolina now 3-3 and on the year. Memphis and UCF in the two-game homestand coming up as the Pirates look to bounce back. All right, let's wrap things up. I want to thank Roy Tesh, the defensive line coach, uh, defensive tackle coach at East Carolina for being with us on this Monday. Also want to thank Marcus Crandall. He's part of the 2022 Hall of Fame class at East Carolina. He'll be inducted this Friday night over at the stadium. So we're looking forward to that Hall of Fame weekend, homecoming weekend for East Carolina Pirate football, ECU in Memphis, 730 kickoff coming up on Saturday night. We'll see you back here next week on the Brian Bailey Show. This has been the Brian Bailey Show, powered by Greenville Utilities, and also brought to you by Angus Grill, Bostick Sug Furniture, Bojangles, East Coast Grady, Papa John's, Pepsi, The Rick House, Greenville Utilities, BMS Builders, Seared Chop House, The Gavigan Agency, Taft Taft and Hagler, Tiebreakers, and Greenville Auto World. Join us next week for another edition of The Brian Bailey Show, right here on Pirate Radio. This is Pirate Radio, WGHB Farmville, 1250 at 92.7 FM Greenville, WDLX Washington, 930 at 104.1 FM, Washington.